how they need the environmental integrity of that lake to support their livelihoods, to support trade, to support their health. And, and the work that's gone on in Ivasha is, is a proof point to me that this subject today, the role of business in water and wetlands, is one that's extremely important. I think there's a huge opportunity for business here. So we use the terminology shared risk but shared opportunity. And I think I will try to, to uh, highlight that as I talk through the, this, this presentation. Um, I have been working on uh, specifically the discussion between business and water for about six or seven years. And in that time, I have seen, probably as you have, a, a complete change in the way in which uh, water is seen, not just by business, but by society. And so, in the last 10 years, this increased understanding that, that water scarcity is a real issue, that it means something. Um, that companies are agreeing and aligning on the various trends and pressures. We will add 3 billion people to this planet. There will be increased pressure on water. And the question always is, what is How's business going to be in that discussion? We also understand, or companies understand, that you can't substitute water. That is, you can't replace it in your agricultural supply chain for some other input. Therefore, we have to do better with what we have. And in the last 10 years, there's been a real understanding or need that we need better baseline data. The companies just really didn't even know where their supply chains were. So that's what's happening. I think, next one, I think in you know, today, 2011, we, we realized that there is increased media and social attention to water. Again, it's not going to be uh, dealt with in a bubble. This discussion of water risk has become uh, very mature, and there's a lot of work understanding what specific risks are to business. We will talk more about this later. Uh, increasing investment pressure, um, and I don't just mean a, a one or two banks. I'm talking about a tremendous amount of groundswell in commercial banks and development banks in financial institutions, lending operations, asking questions about water that they weren't even asking 18 months ago. So the pressure to disclose what you are doing as a company on water is going to become bigger and bigger. <coughs> and this idea that cooperation is essential, that companies can't be seen to be conflicting with people over water resources, they have to be part of a discussion point. Again, I point to Naivasha. And, but I think also very confused about how to respond. Is it a water footprint? Is it a water risk? Is it standards work? What is it that I do? I think that that confusion is real for many companies. But today, as we stand here, we have this discussion. I also get the sense from companies that they want to do something about it. Okay? That they're ready to act. They're ready to go and do something. They don't want to go to another global meeting like this and just talk about the issues. They want to go out there and do something. Um, so we have to kind of help define what that looks like. And of course, companies are doing very different things and have very different maturity. I think we're very familiar with Coca-Cola's very progressive work on water. And you have seen what they've done in the Danube and what, they, what they've done globally. H&M, perhaps you don't know so much about what they're doing on water, but they have identified water as probably one of the biggest issues that they're going to face now and in the future, and are really actively engaging on water. And a company like Chiquita, who grow bananas, who you wouldn't think thought about this issue, have started to realize that their factories are taking groundwater from aquifers that are draining very, very rapidly. So they have to suddenly become more aware of the water context and where they find their operations. There's been a lot of money put into global surveys. This is one of them. This was charting our water future done by McKinsey. You may have seen this. It produced these interesting cost curves. I don't want to get into the science or the math behind this because it was interesting but limited. The point is that seven or eight companies put a hell of a lot of money on the table for this, some as much as a million dollars each, for a report that is fundamentally a report to the public agencies, to government, saying, please manage water better. They're trying to insert themselves into a discussion about how water is managed in the public interest. That's really interesting to me. Seeing companies move from footprints to then putting out reports where they want to have a discussion with government is a real sea change. There's been a lot of work on water footprint. We've done work with Coke on this. We did a lot of work with SAB Miller, the, the, brewer, comp the brewer. A lot of companies have said, okay, what are my supply chains? What's my water footprint? And what are my impacts? And this work has been very interesting to lead companies on a journey. It's not the end game, but it's helped them ask a lot of questions that they didn't know before. And then to, to, to engage their plant managers and their supply chains into a discussion about water. 
Of course, water efficiency and improvement, the efficiency gains are there in China, for example. China's steel has managed to increase productivity by 10 times without increasing water use. So that decoupling between growth and water use is happening at an industrial scale. We also see a lot of uh, willingness of companies wanting to reach down their supply chain and work with their suppliers. So instead of telling their suppliers what to do, working with their suppliers, this is some work that Marks and Spencers did with us, where we engaged all of their supply chains to, to, to think about water stewardship and what they could do as a company to help their suppliers. Very interesting work. It's the kind of thing that the Walmart Consortium is looking at now, the kind of thing that Coke and other companies have been working with over time. But again, it's, it's a recognition that they can't let others solve the problem for them because their risks are also down the supply chain. Uh, I don't know if many of you saw Greenpeace report three or four months ago called Dirty Laundry. Very interesting report about China and about companies, uh, brand companies such as Puma, Nike, Ikea, H&M, who were implicated in this report because their tier one and tier two suppliers were polluting the river. These companies never thought it was their problem before, and Greenpeace made it their problem. So now they're really engaged in their supply chain because it's their problem too. So it's very interesting how far the water journey is taking companies. I think this piece of work uh, is again another moment where we have to think differently about the role of the private sector. This was done through the UN Global Compact, so the, the private sector consortium of the United Nations, if, if you will. And part of that is called the CEO Water Mandate, a very interesting group working with companies on, on six topics around public policy, on, on uh, water management, on supply chains. And this is one product, and it was about responsible business engagement with water policy. It was principles for engaging the public sector on water policy discussions. Now, when I think about companies and how they approach regulation or policy, it's usually to fight their corner. It's usually to say, I want it this way for me. What this document is saying, and what this document is trying to get at, is how can the public sector and the private sector talk about water managed in the public interest, which is completely different. And that is why I think this trend is changing. I think this is because of risk. I think the risks are real in water, and companies realize that they can't be in conflict. So what do I have to do to have a proper conversation with the public sector? Again, we'll come back to this. It'll take years for people to really follow the guidelines. There'll be a lot of things we get right, and a lot of things we get wrong. But this is very different than fighting your corner. Inside WWF, we thought about this for a long time. We thought, how can we explain what companies are doing uh, to, to people who aren't spending all their days thinking about this? And so we put this kind of journey together. Everything from being aware of water issues all the way to the influencing governance. As you imagine, many companies are here. They're just starting to think about the water issue. They're starting to ask questions about what does that mean to my sector? What are my peers doing? And then they start to ask questions about, such as a water footprint, what is my impact? And so they start to do some baseline measuring. They start to calculate some numbers. But they want to know, what is my impact? Based on that, based on that, they will put together an internal action, a plan of some kind, whether that's efficiencies in the factory, water targets, working with supply chains. It's starting to get the house in order. But then something else happens. Then this is, I would suggest, internal. And then what happens is there's an external engagement. Like Lake Naivasha, all of those flower farms are incredibly efficient. It doesn't mean a damn thing because the catchment they're sitting on is over-allocated. There's too much water coming out. So they've done all of this, but now they have to engage with stakeholders. Now they have to have a conversation. And that's really interesting. And the final one is, how do we influence the governance of this river basin to make sure that it meets society's needs, business needs, and protects the environment? That is where I see the journey going. And I think along this five steps, you can fit <coughs> footprints, you can fit life cycle assessments, you can fit European water uh, standards, Alliance for Water Stewardship standards. You can fit things like the different partnerships that NGOs have with, with companies. And you can fit policy discussions. It all fits on this spectrum. 
But companies come to water for very, very different reasons, and we have to recognize that. Not everybody is doing this for the same reason. Some because they just want to market the company, and some just because they want to tie it to corporate social responsibility. And that's fine, because that may be the experience of that company. But there are other companies that are responding to an operational crisis. The water stopped. The local community protested against me. Or they've identified risk in their supply chain. SAB Miller, Coca-Cola, they've looked in their supply chain and said, yeah, there's some risk here. We have to do more than just these first couple of steps. So understanding why companies come into this helps WWF, but it also helps companies to understand what they need to think, what questions they need to ask, and what they need to do about that. What do they need from wetlands and water? And there's a lot of questions in there. As you know, water is so local that they have to ask very, very different questions. Keep on. Um, the reason I'm putting this slide here is because, uh, and I, we, we gave this presentation in Rio about a month ago, when we were talking about disclosure, we were talking about what is it that companies really need to understand. Keep going. The, these first three steps are about these things. They're about private goods. You get water into your factory, you make a product. They're in your direct control. You can do something about this without having to engage externally. It's really about efficiency of the water you have and of the resources you have. And it's fundamentally about the products you make and what are the impacts that your products make. Now that's a very comfortable place for companies and that's where most companies will spend their time. However, as I've shown you in some of what companies are doing, the external environment is not about private goods, it's about public goods. You don't have so much control. And it's not so much about the efficiency of things, it's about the allocation. How is water allocated in a river basin to the multiple needs? And how am I part of that conversation? And it's not so much about products, it's about places. Again, the Danube discussion today, we're going to find out what are the issues that are the risks or the challenges to companies in a specific river basin. I would suggest this is the things that you have impacts, this is how you are impacted. What impacts me externally that I can't control? And that's, to me, and for WWF, the interesting discussion. Because we can't conserve biodiversity by being down here too much. We need to be up here with companies to conserve biodiversity. And I think we are honest with companies about that, because we will not get there through efficiency. We have to fundamentally manage the river basins that you rely on and we rely on and we care about. So that's the journey as I see it for business. And that's where I think the discussions are going. And I think when you look at this, you can see the opportunities for business. You can see the opportunities for ICPDR. You can see the opportunities for WWF in collaboration, in partnership, in collective action, and in joint lobbying against the public agencies whose job it is to manage these basins. Um, we've done a lot of work to try and bring companies into water. I mean, we talk to a lot of progressive companies like the ones here today, but as you know, there are, you know, 90% of the companies haven't even thought of this issue. So we put out this work with German Development Bank on water risk filter. We, we launched it two or three months ago. Uh, we have already assessed 35,000 facilities and 1,500 companies in over 100 countries. It's an online tool. It's completely, um, uh, What's the term? Uh, it's uh, secret's not the right word. Uh, you, nobody can see your data. Thank you very much. I'm getting an English lesson from Berlin. Um, anyway, I just put it out there as something that Andreas will talk a little bit more about. But our objective is to bring more and more companies into this discussion. I think the great thing about this tool, and you go to the next slide, the great thing about this tool for us is that it's not about the risk score. If anything, I'm responding, I'm responding to the idea that there were a lot of tools that put very nice maps, bright red maps out there and said, you're in risk. To me, that's not the issue. The issue to me is what are you doing about it? That's what investors are asking. That's what companies are asking. Don't tell me your footprint. Don't tell me your risk. Tell me what you're doing about it. So the big part of the tool is also thinking about those steps, water awareness, knowledge of impact, internal action, and what you as a company can go do to drive your risk down. It's fundamentally about engaging companies into a discussion on collective action. The great thing about this tool is we are able to see where companies are. So we can look at the river basins around the world and we can see where they're putting their pins. 
and they're allowing WWF to go have a conversation with them afterwards, and that's exciting. So we can bring companies together into a discussion of collective action, as we did in Naivasha, but in other river basins around the world. This came out of the EU Water Framework Directive recently, stakeholder engagement. I put it up here because I hope you were involved. I hope the companies that are here had something to say in the EU Water Framework Directive, and because I think as Philip has alluded to, there is a role here for the private sector in supporting the better policies of the EU Framework Directive, not just through the things you can do in your efficiency and your effluent, but how you can be part of a better discussion about what is best in the public interest within countries, within the EU, to secure the future for business, nature, and, and society. So that's really the discussion I think the other speakers will come to today, specific on their company, more specific to the Danube. Again, this was, this was my overall discussion to you. Last slide. Um, the future, what does this mean for conservation? What does it mean for wetlands and water? I think the philanthropy from companies will continue, and I think that is always welcome, that they pump money into conservation work. But this beyond the fence line work is now very, very real. Okay, again, two, three years ago, I couldn't have a conversation with many companies beyond the fence line. Now, it's, you can't stop them. There's a real connection to risk reduction, so there's going to be much more on collective action, public policy, this idea of shared risk and opportunity, and I think a lot of work will come from the financial institutions. They're going to ask you to disclose what you're doing better. Companies, of course, want to differentiate. Of course, they want to compete. But water is a subject that I guarantee you is not going away. And, I, and you know, how can it? <laughs> we have a limited amount. We're going to add 3 billion people to this planet. We're already stressed. The only way is to work together. So it's not going away. Um, that's our last. We have this report on Lake Naivasha, which I'd be glad to share with people. We're almost finished with the captions. But it, will, it tells the story of that video that you saw and maybe gives you some insights into opportunities for collective action or stewardship. And if you follow the link, uh, you can have a look at a lot of the things we've been writing and saying about um, water and water stewardship. Thank you very much. <laughs>